I like your tattoos. What are those numbers on your arm? Oh, that's uh, the date my dad died. He was a fireman. Died in a fire 17 years ago. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Don't be, it's fine. Knock, knock. Who's there? Not your dad. <laughs> Whatever happened in 2020, we should be very grateful to the powers that be because they have just opened the veils and showed us so much about the world and ourselves, how we were tested. That was a clip from Pete Davidson, a movie, The King of Staten Island, followed by a brief clip from today's guest, Miguel Connor. Let me let Miguel finish that thought. We're not here to be good. We're here to be ourselves. I mean, we don't know who we are, yet we're all going to try to solve the world. And we end up, as you're saying, falling into some cult or some political party because we don't know who we are. And we got to find out what is our purpose. What a crazy thought, hey? I mean, what if that's what this is all about? What if that's what the whole pandemic Great Reset is all about? Is forcing us into a deep dive, a deep spiritual dive. Kind of like the way that Pete does in this movie of putting on the jacket and becoming a firefighter, just like his dad. People email me and they say, well, what are some Gnostic practices? And I said, well... Only you know. You got to find out who you are, what works for you, and you've got to create a life, a system, a gospel and a myth that brings out your inner light. I can't help you. Nobody can help you. Nobody can help you. Oh, my. But in true Miguel Connor fashion, maybe he also means that everyone can help you. We can all help each other. At least that's one of the things I took out of this interview with a true master of deep spirituality and a great podcaster to boot. Hope you stick around for this interview with Miguel Connor and check out his new book. And also, thanks. You know, I put a call out to get people to share the show more and tell other people about the show if you like the show and if you like a particular episode and people have really responded and i certainly appreciate that so i will say again if you like it give it to people that you know will like it too here's my interview with miguel connor Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and today we welcome Miguel Connor back to Skeptico. Miguel has a new book, 10 Snackable Meditations, nice little travel companion kind of thing, and we're going to talk about it. And we're also going to, of course, talk about Miguel in general and his work. He's the creator and host of just the extraordinary Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio, which, if you've listened to this show, you know, has been kind of an ongoing inspiration to me for years and years and years. And it just keeps getting better. Every time I listen to it, there's no downgrade in the quality of those unbelievable openings or the guests that he has on. And the one of the kind of interviews that really can only be done by someone who has really mastered their field. And for Miguel, of course, that field is modern day Gnosticism, kind of popularized Gnosticism, but with a research oriented kind of bent to it, along with, I would say, alternative spirituality in general. So Miguel, it's absolutely always terrific to reconnect with you. Thanks so much for joining me. Always glad to be here, my friend. It's always a, it's always a blast, and here we are, and things are just getting crazier. So, what are you gonna do? Yeah, <laughs> I, do- I was gonna I was gonna hold off on saying that because I want to talk about the book first, but you just brought it up, Miguel. Man, I te- I, I, I got to do a little temperature check on you because I've heard a couple of your shows, and you sound more. I don't know, lit up, engaged, kind of politically, although we were just talking about politically, then I've ever heard you. I like, give that guy a magma hat. <laughs> and I know that's not your, I know oh. that's not your thing, but uh, they, it's kind of beyond, is it beyond interesting times for you? Because you've always been kind of a subtle play it down, interesting times. Is it, is it gotten past that for you? 
I would say so. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this happened before 2020. It probably happened late 2018. I was always doing Aeon Byte like kind of part time, and then I'd do uh, reruns. In fact, I, you, I remember you mentioning, you know, my feed has reruns. I said, yeah, I'm just doing two uh, two a month, and then two reruns because I had this big archive of shows before iTunes and YouTube and the golden age of podcasting. So once I went full time in 2019, I said, well, now no, this is, you know, as they say, shit got serious. I'm doing this full time. I'm getting more subscribers. So now it's time to really put my ass on the line. So my intro started getting more passionate or more uh, uh, surgical towards not not just talking about the ancient Gnostics and occultism and mysticism, but how it can work socially today and of course that of course meant taking aim at the rulers of this age or at a crumbling society and obviously with 2020 with all that happened it just got put on uh, steroids i felt uh, people need to hear more and i need to uh, get more out of my system what's the gospel of thomas famous saying if you bring out what is within you, it will save you. If you do not bring out what, what is within you, it will destroy you. And I think that's in a situation that most people are today. We have to pivot and we have to uh, search and we have to look at other spaces. I think uh, recent, this last year or two has just shown us that everything is everything's in flux and everything's a sham. And here we are. It's time to uh, move to those uh, deeper spaces. I, I get that. But what's most powerful about what you're saying is the voice that's coming through. You, Aeon Byte, Gnosticism, all those things that you said of looking at this broader historical landscape and this spiritual landscape, which brings us to your book. So contrast that, pivot that with 10 snackable meditations and what you've tried to do there. Because in a, in a way, it is that balancing that you've always been about. Yeah, I mean, it's how do I put this? Uh, the book, I mean, sometimes when you're searching for your voice or you're bringing it out from within, it's supposed to come from a deeper place. I mean, you hear that from entrepreneurs and others. Something came over me and I just decided to go for it. And maybe it wasn't uh, the the success you wanted or everything, but there are doors and pathways that open. What did Joseph Campbell famously say? Uh, Follow your bliss and doors will open. I always made the mistake of thinking bliss was some sort of hedonistic thing, like, oh, I'm just going to have fun. But I think he was really talking about the context of who you are, what your purpose is, how it aligns with your deeper self and what you can do to make a difference. So um, like with 10... This goes into my introduction. Something told me you need to put some, you know, wood in the fire. You need to uh, try to speak to uh, the situations that are happening today and make this ancient Gnosticism more relevant. With 10 snackable meditations, it was kind of the same. Uh, I had bought this sort of new e-commerce platform and I was testing it and uh I said, I need something to test it. So I'm just going to, in some of my groups, we kind of share meditation practices and tools for everyday coping, especially these days. And I said, well, I'm going to just do this uh, as an experiment. So I started writing uh, this book and suddenly it started growing and I created the cover. And before I even knew it, I was like, oh, crap, I am publishing a book in like a month uh, in a month uh, process. I was like. I've published the book and now it just came out in Kindle. It's in print version. The audio version is coming out from uh, an Audible and Apple probably in the next week. So it's one of those, uh, the spirit took me and I just went for it. And I have no idea where it's going, what it's going to do. But it's something that I knew it would be helpful. I want it to be helpful because we do live in more fragmented times where people are under a huge amount of anxiety and stress and the old ways might not be working. I mean, I'm sure you can relate to how people are where it's, uh, oh my God, I had a stressful day. I'm gonna wait till I get home and have a drink or watch TV. Or I'm gonna wait till I go to church on Sunday or, or the mosque on Friday or my witch's circle, whatever, or my yoga class, my weekly yoga class. 
but those ways, those old ways don't work. I think we need to, we need a set of spiritual, psychological, and wellness toolboxes at our disposition at all times of the day. It's not good enough. Uh, you had bad news at work or you're overwhelmed because of the Twitter feed and you're going to wait. It's like, no, how am I going to get these meditations and these these tools that that can work for me in an instant because we are being bombarded by media and misinformation and propaganda and the old ways are falling apart from the workplace to uh, societal circles to our very culture so i thought this would be helpful and it's something i learned from alcoholics anonymous they always uh, they always said it's not enough to go to meetings have a toolbox of these spiritual tricks or tricks or uh, what do you call, hacks, if you would, that'll get you. There's an old saying in Alcoholics Anonymous that goes, uh, what does it take for an alcoholic to relapse? A broken shoelace. And it's so true. And we all have that. It could be something like you're coping and the car doesn't start or some pe or some shitty email from a, a client comes in or or your spouse is having a bad day and just rubs you wrong. Of course, we can, the kids break something and suddenly you are off your game. And we live in a culture where this you are off your game is more and more prevalent. I mean, as I'm sure you've heard people like Jordan Peterson and others talking about, these are the best times, less poverty, less war and all that. We've lifted all these people up from poverty in the 19th, 20th century. And I'm saying, yeah, I agree. But suicide, depression, anxiety, domestic violence, it's out of control. And in 2020, which most people or the media overlooks, it's just getting worse. So this is sort of my contribution that has helped me. It's from hallowed traditions, uh, various traditions. Pick the meditation that works for you. And hopefully I will add some more as they go, because uh, I think we need these more than ever, Alex. Awesome. And let's highlight two words snackable and meditation. So one, these might not be what people would expect on medit when they hear the term meditation. They expect a long, arduous sit Formal. with that firm with that firm back and that bamboo slap if you don't do it. And it's uh, the opposite of that. And it's snackable. Here's one. Live life as if everything is rigged in your favor. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Tell, that's, so that's a meditation from the book, people. I just gave one away. You can still get the, but you have to have the book in your pocket so you can pull yeah. it out and remember. But tell us, tell us about that. I love that one. It was yeah, that's Britain. from uh, from Rumi, and of course, the Sufism is a form of Islamic Gnosticism, and some of these are you might say how to reorient your brain, your attitude, and all that as quickly as possible, so you don't just get swept away by the day's. Uh, stress and flows and all the things that are going on today. So a sort of attitude change can really make a difference. Uh, and sometimes it can really help you or at least create a buffer until you hopefully will find the more serious stuff. Again, you should have a good meditation practice that is more formal, takes, you know, half an hour to an hour. But to get there, you can't just go into the, I guess you could go into the work, your work's uh, uh, closet or bathroom and meditate for a half an hour. I guess you kind of could if you were desperate, but uh, these sort of, uh, you might, again, sanity hacks, as I call them, can really help out. I mean, and that just that change of attitude can make a big difference. I mean, there's, again, I go back to Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a saying, uh, when things are falling apart, it means they're really coming together. And as silly as it, as Stuart Smalley as it might sound from Saturday Night Live, uh, it is true because having a vision and seeing the bigger picture and how opportunity can appear when things seem to be closing down in certain ways can be really important, whether it's in the macro of your everyday or your larger picture of your career. We all have the ability to navigate and find opportunity and fulfill our potential. Yeah, that's great. You know, one of the things I appreciated about the book and the meditations were you included this huge body of inspirational work that most people completely overlook. And that's kind of from the entrepreneurial business, self-development 
kind of arena. And there's some great ones. Here's one from your book. It doesn't matter what kind of day you're having. The fact that you're having another day is enough to be grateful for. Now, that's one. We've all heard different versions of it. I love that one. But tell people where that came from, because I, I think it's cool. Yeah, that, is that the one from, I think that's the one from Brad Lee, isn't it? Is that the one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and this is what this right to it, and he has this uh, spiritual exercise, and this guy is a, a sales guru. He lives in Vegas and all that, but he does have that sensibility of using, like you said, self-help, uh, mysticism to sort of uh, manage stress. And he came up with his hack and he said, uh, imagine you wake up in the morning and somebody offers you, let's say, a million dollars. And you're like, okay, that's great. And he says, how would your day go if somebody plopped a million dollars into your account or a big bag of money? And most people will say, I'm going to have a great day, instant, you know, the possibilities have opened, the potential is open, the mind, you you feel freer and lighter, you're going to go through and you're going to call people like, we're going to do this and go on vacation and invest and uh, you're just going to be happier. And then in his exercise, he says, well, imagine if that person said, all right, you can have a million dollars today, but the catch is you don't get to wake up tomorrow. This is it. You're one day with a million dollars. And he then he asked, well, what would you choose? And most people would say, screw that. I don't want a million dollars. I want to wake up tomorrow. I want the rest of my life to continue. And then he asked in a very uh, rhetorical way, well, in that case, does that mean what's more valuable? You waking up in the morning or a million dollars? And that kind of makes you think it's like, no, me waking up in the morning is more valuable than a million dollars, than a billion dollars, than a trillion dollars. And he proposes the question, well, why don't you act like you're waking up to the world is the most valuable thing in the world? And that simple uh, meditation in the morning can be a huge adjustment to your attitude, to your energy, and uh, even to what you accomplish that day. So these sort of little tricks and reorientations of the mind, these little programming hacks, uh, can make a difference. Again, they're not totally transformational. The book tries to give, uh, I give links and uh, bigger quotes and talk about these traditions if you so decide to choose to take them to help you out on your road. And I try to keep it as varied as possible because everybody's different. I assume everybody has a different spiritual, psychological makeup. So I have, uh, I have Christian, Muslim, New Age, occult, uh, all these varied traditions so that a person can find what works for them. Hey, you just, you just hit on one of my hot buttons. I'm going to go skeptical on you. You walked right into it. You walked and right into it, it Miguel. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't have, if you wouldn't have, if you wouldn't have walked right into it, I would have pulled you right in. <laughs> okay. So here's another one. Lord, I offer this sacrifice to you for, and then for the person. God had one. Here's another one. God had one son on earth without sin, but no one without suffering. So yeah, no, no, uh -uh. I ain't buying it. I mean, no, here's my point. Diversity is overrated. Like I just had this thing the other day and I don't know if I, who, who I offended on, on this one, but it's like, no, I don't respect your beliefs. No, make me respect your beliefs. Convince me to respect your beliefs in the court of public opinion. I mean, I'm not going to go, you know, barricade your house or throw firebombs at you. But no, I, if, if you're a, a Mormon, if you're a Scientologist, if you're a Mooney, I just interviewed a great guy. I love the guy. 30 years of Mooney. Uh, no, 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 no. I don't respect your beliefs. If you're Christian, I was going to say fundamentalist Christian, but that's just passing it off. No, I don't necessarily respect your beliefs. And as a matter of fact, this quote that you've given in a lot of ways, so it might connect with some people. And that's what I hear you saying, kind of smorgasbord style. So let me turn this into a question. From a Aeon Bite, Gnostic, toughness, because there's a certain toughness to the Gnosis and willing to face the fight, the challenge head on. I don't want to hear that... Uh, uh, there's one son on earth without sin. Wait a minute. Uh, how, do, how do you know that? that that's, that is, 
that is different than all the other quotes in a way that I think we need to at least be explicit. If somebody buys into that, fine. But no, I, I don't. I don't. I don't know that that God had one son on earth without sin. I don't know that. Yeah, I mean, uh, in a way, between us and your audience, it is a bit sneaky because Augustine is a former Gnostic. He was a Gnostic, but he found he couldn't. Uh, it didn't give him the structure that he wanted. In other words, he couldn't. Uh, it couldn't help him keep his dick in his pants. So he went from Gnosticism to uh, uh, Catholicism or Orthodox. And he found the structure there, but he, even to the day he died, uh, he was accused of mixing in Neoplatonic and Gnostic ideas into his form of Christianity. And I find a lot of his writings really beautiful and inspirational. I just think he was, uh, he was searching. As far as the suffering goes, I mean, it is true. Uh, suffering is uh, definitely for everybody. And by the suffering, I mean, in Buddhism, what do you call it? You call it suffering, Buddha said dukkha which is like a wheel that's always sort of loose when you're pulling the card. It's very much like Morpheus says in the matrix, you know, there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is. It's like a splinter in your mind driving you mad. I think that's what the Buddha would, we all know there's something wrong. I think 2021 and 2020 is stress that, and we don't know what to do. We're really uncomfortable in our skin and our minds. So that's what he was referring to as, uh, as suffering and uh um obviously everybody suffers because life brings you what life brings you so um i don't know why i got into that tangent about you did that wasn't that wasn't a tangent i was pulling you into the deep waters and as usual you swim you swim with no problem to the side of the pool no matter where i pull you but i'll I'll follow up on that i love the business quote like i said one of the most and uh Tim Grimes, who is a fantastic, uh, I love love Tim, and he was on the show recently to talk about his book, The Joy of Not Thinking, which is very non-dual and very in keeping with this conversation we're having. But he turned me on to the fact that Napoleon Hill, of course, one of the most famous foundational business writers of all time, authored Think and Grow Rich, which became the kind of seminal book that everyone's built off of. Scam artist, complete scam artist. And they go back and they trace his history and he's a scoundrel from the beginning all the stuff he's doing he's trying to do this business scam and you know leaving abandoning this child in this state and moving to another just the and like when we move into the spiritual realm we find the or the people who are trying to co-op spirituality we find the same thing you know the david koresh is the example i've been using lately of course the Branch Davidian Waco thing. It's a little bit past maybe what some people remember, but I just stumbled across this little factoid that one, one of the ways that David Koresh really kind of hoodwinked all these good, honest Christians was he had this incredible photographic memory and had virtually memorized the Bible. So he could spew out scripture, just boom, boom, boom off the top of his head. So what he also liked to do is fuck 12 year old and 13 year old girls. So combine no, those, that. what's that? I so know that. Well. combine those two <laughs> interests. And, and uh, what he had was, he would go to these people that he would lure to his little compound as this kind of great, you know, commune and stuff like that. And he'd say, Look, I tell you what, I've talked to the man. And Jesus has told me I need to have a 1000 wives. And I need to really kind of start this whole new thing and you know what i'm checking out your daughter over there i think she'd be i think she'd be right in one of jesus's flock here right from the beginning she ought to be one of my wives and he had many many of these very young teenage girl wives you know and that makes a different spin on waco and you know we all hear oh my they Rammed, it wasn't such a great place and they probably didn't handle it well. But the point, the point is the sage on the stage, it's like a conversation we had before. And what I think Aeon Bite is about and what you are about is spiritual disintermediation. You don't need David Koresh to tell you about your spiritual experience, to reinterpret it. And we don't need Christianity to do that. And we don't need their book that people can memorize and no matter who it is. And we don't need 
you know, uh, OSHA up in uh, Oregon in, in his cult. So <laughs> we don't need any of those guys. Uh, it's not, no, it's not OSHA. What is it? It's, uh, it's Osho, uh, Rashish. Osho, yeah, Osho, Osho Rashish. So the, 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 you know, do we have to be, where do we draw that line? You know, so he, he, how do you do that? How do you balance the 10 snackable meditations, smorgasbord, find what you like, write your own gospel, create your own myth, which is so beautiful with don't be a chump. I mean, be, be looking out for people who are going to try and co-op your spiritual experience. And I think that's also very much in keeping with what we're talking about with what's going on in the last couple of years. Yeah, I think that's well said, Alex. Uh, I always tell people that we are all points of light trying to, uh, on a journey, passing each other by, inspiring each other. And that's the attitude it should be. You shouldn't have any sort of guru or anything like that. At the end of the day, it's your salvation, your unique journey, and you are there to inspire others and then move on in your journey, just as others should inspire you and, you know, the passing ships in the night. I think that's the that's definitely the best attitude to have. Create your own narrative to life. Don't let others write those because if we're in a stage where reality is going to disappoint us, sorry, but every single human being out there is going to disappoint us. And what can be weaponized will be weaponized or is already weaponized. If the Roman Empire had a complete lockdown on everything, same with the today with the American Empire and the CIA. I mean, I've gone through that journey. Uh, a writer who I love, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you know, the famous communist that was banned from coming into the United States on the CIA payroll. Frank Zappa, remember, Mr. I'm going to fight Tipper Gore for free speech. And we were us Gen X were like, all right, you know, we got to defend for oh, military intelligence. And you go, on, I mean, you can go, Pythagoras was probably a spy for some government. I mean, it's this is the world we live in. What can be weaponized has already been weaponized. So you need to know this and accept this and find your own inner light because that's just the it's just the, the way it is. What's the saying? If it can be destroyed by the truth, then it deserves to be destroyed by the truth. But that doesn't change the game of your awakening. Your awakening is still the most important thing that you will have, your self-knowledge and who these people and gurus and what they corrupt and destroy really has nothing to do with it. And you can move on again with 10 snackable meditations, move on to the next slide and get inspired and move away. Uh, even the Buddha say, if you see the Buddha on the road, kill him. I always say same with Jesus, same with your heroes, same with your parents and, you know, metaphoric, you know, I'm not saying literally, but <laughs> kill them Absolutely. all, kill them all. It's your road. It's your road, man. Uh, uh, just so uh, inspirationally said. And, uh, you know, the parents thing to me is like the way that I hear you saying that is like if you uh, I was just having this conversation uh, with my friend Mark Palmer on his podcast my family thinks I'm crazy. And we were talking about just how, how difficult this path is, any path that is a spiritual path, that is truly this trying to tap into the inner part. And when you walk into the forest and you have the divine and it comes through the trees and you never thought you'd experience it and you experience love like you never have before. And then you come home and mom and dad say, oh no, son, oh no, honey. That's not what we believe. We don't believe that. And then you go, oh, we, we don't believe that. Mom and dad, mom and dad are good people. And I know they're good people. And grandma and grandpa are, are good people. And they all believe that that's not, that my experience is, is not good. Not That's the Buddha that you're talking about that needs to be, we need to step over that Buddha and get to the other side, which maybe brings me to the, the final uh, quote that I was going to tee up to people from 10 Snackable Meditations. Uh, another fun time, phenomenal meditation. This is not a battle of good versus evil. This is a battle of you 
versus lack of you. That's what you were saying, I think. So talk about that as we finish talking. Yeah, about that's, uh, that's from uh, James True. What is his book? Best Apocalypse Ever, how we should. Whatever happened in 2020, we should be very grateful to the powers that be because they have just opened the veils and showed us so much about the world and ourselves, how we were tested. So I, I, I certainly agree with that point. And it is true because we are here. What it, that's what Carl Jung said, and it's a book too. We're not here to be good. We're here to be ourselves. I mean, we don't know who we are yet we're all going to try to solve the world and we end up, as you're saying, falling into some cult or some political party because we don't know who we are and we got to find out what is our purpose? Who are we? And there's so many layers of programming and bullshit that we have to go through. When that happens, as I tell people, once you start waking up, uh, what did Anthony DeMello said? Spirituality is waking up. And Clark Emery, the famous uh, Buddhist scholar, said the awakening of an individual is a cosmic event. Once you find out who you are, then the answers will come in a very silent, automatic way. You'll find like me doing 10 snackable meditations or Aeon Bite. It just it comes to you and you go with it. And it's beyond your egoic constructed self. I mean, you're talking about parents and I know I can blame my parents, but my programming certainly did a lot of damage to my kids. I remember a, a Jungian guy saying uh, the parents job is to break the souls of our children. And I'd be like, oh, that's crazy. But it is true. Like school. I always thought school was there was something wrong with this, like a splinter in, a, in my mind driving me crazy. And but I thought, well, I got to send my kids to school. And I did. But then you start realizing, wait a second school is just like a prison and there's memes on the internet right the bus the cafeteria the the what the architecture and you go holy shit schools are prisons it's a place to dehumanize our children and programming and stop their potential it's nothing like the waldorf schools or anything like that and with my first marriage i sent my kids to school but in this marriage it's like they are completely homeschooled and they're obviously mentally academically all that they're far ahead of kids that go to school at least here in illinois i can't judge anywhere else so uh yeah find out who you are that is the great uh, rebellion finding out who you are is what they whoever they are don't want you to find out and that's where you find out your purpose your peace and all that so that's the journey i certainly advise to people instead of trying to go out and change the world or assimilate to some system or religion or anything like that. As you can see, Alex, I'd be the worst guru in the world. <laughs> I would never make any, <laughs> not good at it because people email me and they say, well, what are some Gnostic practices? And I said, well, only, you know, you got to find out who you are, what works for you. And you've got to create a life, a system, a gospel and a myth that brings out your inner light. I can't help you. Nobody can help you. Well, it's funny that you say that you'd be a terrible guru because I've never talked to you about this, but I'm sure you get pulled into being a guru all the time. It, I, I can only imagine. So how do you how do you balance that, I guess, would be one question. Uh, well, like anything, uh, I don't take myself too seriously because I know most of what I am is a construct. 99% of who I am has been programmed from my, my hand gestures to my accent to, you know, why do I like the Bears? If I was the Chicago Bears, wouldn't I be more authentic if I liked the team from like San Diego or the Packers? You know what I mean? So I try to uh, just realize not to take myself too seriously or reality in itself. So uh, that's really the way. And of course, there is the inner, there's that inner fire where I want everybody to find their own bliss from Joseph Campbell, to find their own road. And that passion to help those who suffer keeps me humble in a lot of ways because there's no time to sit on your laurels or uh, get a big head about things. I mean, we got to be moving fast here. Great. So, Miguel, you've already mentioned in the book, it's coming out in Audible. What else do we want to say about this book, Ten Snackable Meditations? I, I do think people will, will really enjoy it. You, you can get a very good sense. You can go look inside and see if it's for you. It's really something 
that you need to have on your Kindle if you keep your Kindle with your, your phone or in your pocket, because it can be that kind of touchstone, bring me back to a good space kind of thing. What else do we want to tell people about it? Well, yeah, and if you get the paperback, just uh, put it in your back pocket uh, to use it. I think we've covered a lot of it. Uh, it's got, if you want to expand on it, if it's got quotes, it's got links to YouTube videos with bigger exercises. It's from traditions from thousands of years ago, from Tibetan monks to New Age guys to salespeople, like we just talked about, to Brad Leah. So it's a good, it's a nice, good hodgepodge stew of the wisdom of the ages. When it comes down to it, nothing new under the sun. That's what all these masters are saying. Just wake up. Don't sweat the small temporal stuff because it's all just temporal. And at the end of the day, you're going to be fine if you don't lose uh, sight of who you really are, which is just an eternal being. You are an eternal being that somehow forgot and now thinks you are in this uh, temporal world or even worse in the skeptical way somebody convinced you you're a biological robot and now it's just a universe of nihilism and mechanism that's uh that's pretty painful and you don't have to be in pain nice okay and i say that miguel because uh, i want to pivot a little bit Thanks again to Miguel Connor for joining me today on Skeptico. As I was just referencing, you know, there is a second half to this interview. It was just so different than the first half that I felt like I need to release it as a second episode, which I will do in a few weeks. But for now, I thought we would just focus in on this great, great interview and this book that he did. And I would tee up one question from this one. Which one of Miguel's meditations did you like best? Did you most relate to? Let me know any way you find me. I have a bunch of new ways to kind of find me on the Skeptico website. So go there. More ways to connect, more ways to do things that become part of, I guess, a community of Skeptico listeners. So do check that out if that sounds interesting to you. I got a lot more to come. Until next time, take care and bye for now.